Good afternoon and welcome to the closing ceremony of the 51st St. Gallen Symposium. I don't know about you, but to me it has felt like these last two days, two and a half days with dinner have just flown by. We've gotten a lot of work done. We've had a lot of new thoughts together and we've provoked a lot of different responses to the challenges that we face. To give you a summary of everything that you did collectively over those last two days, we have a little snapshot for you. Yeah, as we started yesterday with the introduction of our co-chairman, uh, Lord Brian Griffiths, we would now like to introduce our second co-chairman of our initiative, Mr. Dominic Barton. And Mr. Dominic Barton, um, he is uh, the co-chairman of the Gallant Symposium since 2019. And before of that, he was a global managing partner at McKinsey, and he was served there from 2009 to 2018. And yeah, Mr. Barton, thanks for having here. Unfortunately, not physical here in St. Gallen, but I'm happy to hear your words regarding our topic, collaborative advantage. Thank you so much, Nicholas. And uh, Ms. Kluver Ashbrook, thank you, both of you, uh, for the kind introduction and also for accompanying us so well over the last two and a half, uh, half days. Um, I wish I could have been with you uh, in person, but I'm uh, calling you uh, beaming in from Perth in, uh, in Western Australia. Um, I have been able to sort, of part, to sort of tap into some of the discussions that have gone on, uh, which I'd be, I thought had been terrific. And it's great to see, again, this intergenerational collaboration uh, that has occurred and something that I hope Professor Schur is very excited about because it just seems to get better and better every year uh, that we, we go through it. Um, I actually would like to focus maybe on three takeaways that I took uh, from what I was able to see and also what I've, I've heard from uh, friends and, and colleagues who were there. And the three sort of takeaways for me were as follows. Uh, first, that collaboration uh, can sometimes come with pain. Um, you know, when we're thinking about working on important issues together, uh, we may be, you know, having very different points of view of the world. And I think we saw a bit of that when we're thinking about uh, the, the sort of some of the opportunities and challenges between China and the West, there are some very different views of the world and how things work. If you think about collective values versus individual values, and that doesn't mean that uh, one is right or wrong in that case, it's just that, they're, that they can be challenging uh, because there's different views. Um, we saw a little bit of it too in short term versus long term. This is something that I worry a lot about because they're, we often are quite short-term oriented, uh, but some of the gains we may get if we sacrifice some of the short-term will help us more significantly sustainably for the long-term. And I think that's at the very essence of this intergenerational dialogue. So I just suggest those as, uh, as two of many examples, but that we are going to have tensions when we uh, have this dialogue and we should accept them. Uh, and I think, and, and embrace them in a sense to understand how we can actually work through things. And I think one of the biggest issues as is we've talked about in this session and also in others is around uh, climate change and how we're going to work. That is a truly intergenerational challenge. And we've, I think, been too short-term focused on that versus uh, long-term. Um, the second uh, sort of takeaway for me is despite these challenges and frictions that we're going to have. And sometimes that, again, can be between generations or it can be between uh, stakeholders. We, we just have no option uh, 
but to dive into them. And, and again, I mentioned one, but there's a number of climate action, food security, uh, helping refugees. We just, we have literally hundreds of millions of refugees. War uh, makes that uh, even more poignant uh, today. Uh, but we're going to have to build more intergenerational trust uh, to be able to deal with these challenges. We've got to dive in, but we've got to build that that trust. And again, I think the St. Gallen Symposium is uh, is one of the very, very best ways in which we can do that, because it's not only different generations, it's uh, different generations from different parts of the world. Uh, so we have to keep it in that. So one, you know, collaboration is difficult to, we have to do it. We have so many big issues that we have to work on. And three, I actually thought there were some very specific ideas that were identified. And these are just mine, so please, there, it's not meant to be a summary. It's just a reflection from me. Each of us will take ours. But there were three in particular that um, I noted. Um, one, ensuring a more inclusive educational system. That surely is something that globally we all need to be thinking about. Uh, two, environmental sustainability. I think we, we know that there. We just got to do something uh, about it. Uh, and three, one that um, I had heard little bits about before, but not as much, uh, but did hear it in this particular symposium, uh, developing what I call a forward-looking welfare state. Uh, so some pretty big ideas that were put on the table. Those are just three of the ones that I had picked up. I know there were many, uh, many others. Uh, but I think these are things that we want to move forward on. And in, when we think about this new generational uh, uh, contract. Um, the one point I would just say around this, you know, working together uh, as we go forward that I'm very, very excited about uh, is the fact that starting this May, uh, the St. Gallen Symposium is partnering with the Club of Rome, where we can leverage our platforms to have a more continuous dialogue. And I think that's wonderful. That's another type of a collaboration uh, with a wonderful institution. Uh, and I think, um, you know, one plus one equals nine uh, when you put those uh, organizations uh, together. And I think when we do this, let's think about having a joint ambition uh, with these organizations, again, education, uh, health, sustainability, technology, and so forth. And let's develop actionable projects. That's some of the things that will come out of this. So I think this collaboration is going to be, is a, is a very good innovation of itself, in and of itself, it's going to help us. Um, I think using the uh, cross-generational transformation lab, which was launched this year, is a, it provides a very good forum for how we can continue to have these discussions and push the collaboration uh, beyond the St. Gallen Symposium, which is obviously a wonderful node and focusing device. But I think over time, what the symposium has done is ensured that this can be uh, continuous uh, and global and what we're doing it. So I would encourage everyone uh, to think and act around ideas on this uh, cross-generational transformation lab. Anyhow, that's enough for me. I just want to thank uh, the team again for organizing such a superb uh, symposium uh, and for the incredible participation from everyone in the audience physically uh, and also virtually. Uh, thank you so much. There's been a real kinetic energy in this room. And what I hope and what I hear from your remarks, Dominic Barton, is that it carried all the way across the oceans and miles in Perth, Australia. And I, I do wish that you could feel this because this was this buzz here has been in this room since the dinner the night before we started. And my great hope and my great confidence, frankly, is that this will continue out of this room and into the world. So thank you again for your succinct summary. Um, we have our own, as you rightly said, all of us are going to be walking away with different nuggets, um, but most importantly, with themes and fields of action. So thank you again. <laughs> Collaborative 
advantage. We've learned over these last two days that it must take, collaboration must take on new forms, and it must challenge our very fundamental assumptions. In geopolitical terms, we have seen the proverbial West grow much closer with allies in Asia Pacific, uh, including Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, all based around other interpretations of our same values that are based in an idea of sovereignty, of human dignity, of the inviolability of human rights. It has brought so many parts of our world closer together. And yet it made close, clear to us in the West how poorly we have treated our multilateral, our collaborative instruments over the past 70 years, how we've abrogated, in some cases, on their basic premise, we've refused to listen, we've refused to be present, and now it is evident that we must change our ways. We must collectively address challenges that democracies face from autocracies, and we have to rethink both the ideas of independence and interdependence. And to address the ideas of the global commons, we heard in so many panels and discussions over the past couple of days, climate we discussed, pandemic migration, Dominic Barton mentioned, economic and physical security. We have to do things differently. We have to pull together, we have to think smartly about the stakeholders we bring to the table, corporate, non-government, urban. They were all here at the St. Gallen Symposium. But we need to address these, these issues functionally, and of course, we need to address them intergenerationally. If you want to challenge our assumptions we have, maybe have to think about our values, the moral assumptions you like to have in the future. Um, we need a shared model, and we would like to promote us in the traditional fairness, while well, currently it seems not to work well with those challenges we have ahead of us. And this morning we had the uh, experiment to really um, have some people discussing about topics maybe they have a completely different opinion just to be able to discuss those values we have. And in the end, the last session we talked about how we would like to work in the future and how we'd like to work together. In the end, we have to talk about how we would do the leadership as well how, if we work together and the culture we need to do so to engage our employers, to engage, to be able to have those ideas to uh, solve those problems. And to sum it up, we need action. This will not be easy, Dominic Barton said it himself. It's going to demand adaptive change. It's going to demand leadership. And those things are painful. Change is painful. Dysfunction exists for a reason, because it makes people comfortable. So we'll have to get collectively uncomfortable to question some of our long-held assumptions and to think about structurally how we change our way of working together. But we heard yesterday and today that it doesn't need to stay that way, that there's optimism inherent in change, that the people in the room, the people in this room, are a large part of the answer. The students, the 450 who I hope you have met while you were here, who arranged this conference for you, but also the leaders of tomorrow from all over the globe, and the alumni who have carried these 450 students forward into this conference and beyond. They are the signal and sort of the wind beneath our proverbial wings to get out there and do good and do better. In our team, we discussed our topic collaborative advantage since September when we had the topic launch. And I would like to have two people on stage from our team to share their opinion on this team and how maybe their values we discussed evolved throughout last month. And I would like to introduce you Sophia Gamp. She is responsible for participants from Switzerland, especially the Italian-speaking part in Italy. And now she has been responsible for the communication here at the symposium. And more about Fabio Heine, he is responsible for Leaders of Tomorrow program. So those of you who are able to come to St. Gallen and have the touristic program on Tuesday, a lot program on Wednesday, and those gatherings <laughs> for the last two days, um, he has been one of those people responsible. So please have an applause for both of them to share their opinion. <laughs> What an image to have all of you sitting here in St. Gaum. When we started this journey in September, we were quite unsure if it would be possible to welcome you physically. And look where we are now. We felt the anticipation for a physical event growing over the long three years, and we are so grateful that you trusted us and that you showed up in numbers. 
We are thankful for all the profound conversations that we could have with you, even if in the past few days, or let's say even weeks, our nights got shorter and shorter, we were thrilled to finally spend the 51st Sankan Symposium with all of you. We came together to talk about collaborative advantage in its different facets. We discussed about when and how collaboration makes sense. But let us return to its foundation, what collaboration means for us as human beings and how we can collectively prosper. Competition might have its place in society. However, when we look at it in a biological and historical way, we're not lone fighters. Rather, are we dependent on our community? Dependency, a generally negative connoted word in our society. I still see it as positive, since in this case, it also grants us security and it allows us to grow and to learn by interaction with our parents, colleagues, teachers. Our urge to interact with our surrounding is deeply encored in every one of us. I mean, talking to myself might be fun to, from time to time, and maybe some of you will do so as well, but at, I don't, it doesn't satisfy my interest of learning something new. We need each other to do so. To just take an example about how many languages we have in common. For, take the English language. For many of us, it's not our mother tongue, and still we are engaged in learning the language so that encounters like this here can be made possible. Although, and maybe because we have so many different ways of communication, if we're honest, sometimes we beat around the bush. To go even further, is it possible that sometimes, or maybe even often, we miss to share the information that actually would matter? I'm just thinking about discussions I have from time to time with an elderly lady we have a 75 years of age gap. So hearing about her life stories, her experiences, also of being a refugee during World War II is impressive, sometimes also harrowing. She describes images to me I could not have pictured and exposes questions I otherwise would not have asked. Maybe it's simplified, but isn't this transfer of information what we could almost describe as a natural collaborative advantage? When we look around in this room, and Mr. Cassis yesterday took almost a similar example, there are over 600 life stories sitting here, an amount of wisdom no one of us could achieve in just one life. But we need to share it through dialogue so that this wisdom can be unlocked and that we can start further collaboration. Sophia, while it is commendable to learn from your parents and to listen to the stories of your grand parents, we must not forget the fact that we live in a highly complex world. We live in a world which is intertwined and not as straightforward as the exchange with the narrow circle of acquaintances. Nor do we find the same prerequisites such as here at the St. Gallen Symposium around the globe. The past few years were highly demanding for all of us and have left deep scars on our relations to our friends and family. Being faced on a daily basis with news of numerous fatalities, economic problems, and many other issues which moved us deeply at the beginning, left us at some point of time emotionally indifferent. I don't know whether it was the case with you as well, but after some time I checked the news less frequently in order to not be too exposed to the news. Too far away were the heartwarming stories and we have grown indifferent to the sufferings of strangers. Maybe this indifference is natural. We are simply bombarded with information and we do not have the possibility to actively process it as we do when we hold a conversation with a person who is affected by the issue. The pictures from the horrific war in the Ukraine have once again left us lost for words. Updates were coming in by the second, and we were informed in real time about the atrocities committed in the heart of Europe. Reassuringly, a large part of the global community has reacted to this dreadful humanitarian situation. Individuals have collected what they could and donated it to the people in need. 
The spirit of solidarity and unity is felt again after years of rising tensions between the various social groups. How can this spirit of solidarity and unity be kept alive and even transferred to other issues? And how can we avoid getting emotionally indifferent about the sufferings of life and death of other humans? Even on an international level, there was a genuine interest to mitigate the sufferings of the disadvantaged population. And the European Union has, for example, agreed to not deny the atrocities committed right in its backyard and stood united for the rights of the oppressed. Crushing sanctions were imposed and humanitarian as well as military equipment has been donated. Even if there are different ways to help, the common goal is clear and it unites the individual nations. In face of this sweeping and determined reaction, it begs one question. Where has this response been in earlier wars? Mm. Sophia, you brought up the phrase natural collaborative advantage. How can we use this to keep up the connection which the war has fortified in the past few weeks? Fabio, I do not know. Um, but I'm telling you what I'm observing. Dialogue is the fundamental instrument for firstly, find an answer to your question, and then secondly, for being able to start further collaboration in our society and to make use of this advantage. There are so many crises and events that humanity overcame already. We must speak about them, be clear with what we did right, but maybe even more important, acknowledging our faults and sharing our lessons learned because there are so many more mistakes that we, the young generation, can make. So let's not waste energy by just repeating the ones that you did already. Moreover, we might benefit from all our experiences, which let us better assess the here and now. In the current times, dialogue is needed to bridge the divide between the opposing parties. While there has been a rise in solidarity within the different parties, there is a massive rift between the opponents. At the same time, dialogue is needed to find solutions to current challenges. Problems have been identified in the past years. Now it is time to find common solutions and to use the experiences and wisdom we gained by past challenges. We do not think that dialogue is the key magical solution to all the problems. But without it, freedom moves even farther away. Through the exchange, we may learn our communalities and interests again and create a new tie. Differences might also appear, which let us find compromises and create a new common ground. Let us make use of this natural collaborative advantage by listening and sharing our stories and mistakes so that the future generations do not have to repeat them. This virtue is needed to be able to find sustainable solutions for our common future. But for now, we want to thank you for the exchange we had during this week. But not only during this week, also during the year, to all our benefactors who welcomed our team members and were interested in this cross-generational dialogue. Without this interest and support for this initiative, the St. Gaon Symposium would not be possible. Thank you to all the leaders of tomorrow who demonstrated that we deserve to be heard and be included in the dialogue. Nevertheless, we would not be standing here if it weren't for the member of the St. Gaon Foundation for International Studies, who are the backbone to our team. Thank you for your daily support and work. Another big thank you goes to our ISC alumni crew that is here today, or they are here today, and they supported us with their knowledge, not only during the year, but mainly during the last week. You are the strength of this initiative. The St. Gallen Symposium wouldn't be the same without the over 450 student helpers of the University of St. Gallen. A massive thank you for your hard work and excellent service. We are
are not done yet, to be honest. There are some more people we actually have to thank. <laughs> we also need to thank to all our parents who had to suffer under our absolutely agonizing absence during the past few months. They supported us in ways we couldn't even imagine eight months ago. And last but not least, before we can continue with our solution-oriented discussions during the evening program, let us take a last minute to introduce you to the faces behind the 51st St. Gaon Symposium. We have been waiting for this moment for the last 10 months, and it was a wild ride no one of us would have wanted to miss. 33 students and one common interest that united us in a way we could never have imagined before. We were responsible for the markets such as Switzerland, Germany, Austria, France, Italy, United Kingdom, the Nordics, Benelux, Singapore, Japan, and India. As well as for bringing all the leaders of tomorrow and aspiring leaders to St. Gallen. In the last few months, we were engaged in doing communication, organizing transport, food and beverages, services, social sessions, innovation and technology, digital operations, and last but not least, technical ones. So please, welcome with us on stage the 51st International Students' Committee.